C'est le nifty fifty. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so it's recording. Okay, so as I was saying, so that it's on uh, record, <laughs> uh, welcome to the first of a series of webinars for advanced users of Historiana. Um, the aim is to demonstrate how to use the platform for historical thinking, and the session will be hosted by Helen Nelson, who is uh, heavily um, involved with Historiana as part of the teaching and learning team, and also a teacher trainer in the UK. And she's created many um, many e-learning activities on Historiana, so we'll have great insights tonight. <laughs> um, this session particularly is focused on how to teach students using source material as evidence. And um, yes, and it, uh, is, um, it will use uh, Historiana source collection and other resources from the period of 45 to 50 and give examples of activities on how to inspire students to develop their knowledge um, and how to use that in the classroom for online and offline teaching. So without further ado, Helen, take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to uh, the screen, I hope. Is that sharing screen yet? Not yet, I can't see it. Just bear with me a moment while I do the share screen function. Helps if you actually press <laughs> into it. Okay, hopefully that's, uh, that's We've coming seen up now. now. Yes. Great. I'll just take it back. Welcome, everybody. I think uh, history teachers are completely awesome. And um, you are even beyond amazing because this has been the longest term ever, I think. I know some of you, like me, have been teaching for a long time. And boy, this has been something else, hasn't it? It is such a joy to see you all. And I hope that the next hour or so together will be useful or at least food for thought in some ways um, and, I, and I hope you'll have some some questions to, to put me and and challenge me. If you can hear a little beep don't worry that's just people um, coming into the waiting room which is lovely it's like a little doorbell isn't it and we hope we're not going to have any power issues tonight but if we do um, we'll grit it through and the recording will work anyway so let's cross our fingers that the um, IT gremlins are, uh, are busy elsewhere this evening. So, as uh, Lorraine said, um, what I want to do is focus specifically in this next hour on um, discovering how we can use sources to engage our students, specifically with this topic of Europe 1945 to the 1950s, that period in which um, essentially what we now know as the European project was born and in which Europe began to build back from catastrophe, of course. And I really want to focus in quite hard on our teacher knowledge about how we teach students to use sources as evidence for making um, inquiries as historians would, so modeling operating as historians in the history classroom. And I am going to um, hopefully show you as well how the new Historiana e-learning tools can support that. And I'm very much hoping that you've had a chance to have a look at the introductory um, film on that with the latest on the e-activity tools, because um, I don't know about you, but I find it quite difficult when people are leaping about from screen to screen in, in webinars, particularly if there is a, um, an IT delay. So we wanted to actually minimize that. And also, I think it's quite something to be trying to work out how to new, use new IT and think about history. And especially for those of you who are not operating in your first language, um, for which, as you know, you have my endless respect. Um, so I've put everything onto a PowerPoint initially, and then what I will do towards the end is actually walk you through how I have converted all of this into an e-learning activity angled for students. Um, so hopefully it will be a, an e-learning sandwich in that way. Um, and you can, of course, return to the introductory video as frequently as you need to. And I still do sometimes to hear Lorraine brilliantly reminding me how to use a particular bit of the tool when I've had a busy week and forgotten. It's wonderful to be able to stop and start things. And of course, for those of you listening on recording, you can uh, stop and start me as well, which is also good. Okay, let's make a start then. The first 
thing that I want to talk about is the use of sources to intrigue students, to build their curiosity, to hook them into learning, to excite them, and to help them use sources as evidence to build a sense of period, to build a world in their minds. Um, that engaging students as a topic starts is, as we all know, important for learning. And helping students to a strong sense of period of the world at the time they are learning helps them to make sense of the, the people and the events that they're going to focus on specifically. Quite a lot of research evidence now suggests that children are not secure in their understanding of the past unless they can draw upon a wider understanding of what the period that they are studying was like. We all know what it's like when I think we read a student's material and we can, sort of, we can tell that they're secure. We know that if we have a conversation with them, they can move around within the knowledge. Um, they can inhabit the world. We have a sense that they understand the physical features of the period that they're studying. We have a sense that they know the values and beliefs as much as anybody can of people in the past. They've they've got a sense of the mentalities. They're not um, dealing in dreadful anachronisms. They have some sense of the variety of perspectives that existed in a time and in a place and how things were developing. It might be, for example, that they're studying the Middle Ages and you get a sense that they have an understanding of how important the Christian church was in Western Europe, for example. So the model I'm going to um, give you is very much focused, as I say before, on the 1940s to 1950s. Um, and this is an example of a way that I would use um, source material as a task begins to focus on sense of period. Now this here is a poster, as many of you will have already immediately seen as history teachers. And I have actually translated the, the German for you if you need it, although I'm actually not going to use that right now. I want us to focus in on the two pictures on the poster. And I want us first to focus on the picture at the top, and what I would say to students is look at that picture. And what can you actually see? So just have to think to yourselves, what can you actually see in that picture? Taking a bit of time to do some close observation with students is really important. As we know, students will move on very quickly if we give them a chance. But saying, come on, what can you see? Look again. What else can you see? So my first um, question to them is what can you see? And my second question is what does that suggest, that first picture, just that first picture at the top, what does it suggest about the experience of daily life for many people in Western Germany? in 1947. Put some ideas in the chat. What does it suggest? Let's, uh, let's turn you into the students for a moment. Any ideas? When you look at that first picture, what does it suggest to you? What does it suggest about the experience of daily life? What thoughts come to your mind as you look at that picture? Anybody going to put any ideas in the chat for me? As you look at that first picture at the top, what thoughts do you about daily life for people in Western Germany? Mm, poverty. Yeah. Anxiety. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we're inferring, it's been suggested to us, but it's really there, isn't it? People stood with what might be everything they own on their back. We don't know what's in those bags, but, but there's a sense of, of crowding round, isn't it? 
good. They could be leaving for somebody. Is it food? Is there plenty of food? Have they got no food? Are they moving? A real sense of burden, absolutely. Yeah, struggling with the crowd and, and some suffering. The impression we get, we can't be certain, but the impression is, is certainly all those things. So then I'd be saying to them, OK, do the same for the second picture. Have a look at this picture. two years later, 1949. It's a picture. What does it suggest? Many people in Western Germany were wanting and hoping for in the later 1940s. And as you can guess, and as well done, Georgia, straight in there, brilliant, that people were wanting abundance. Um, there's something karma about that picture, isn't there? That's a brilliant word, freshness. There's enough food and there's a choice of food, isn't there? That idea of a market. Yeah, we're no longer stood with all our bags around us waiting for things. Look at those women in the back. They're just stood about having a chat with friends. Gosh, we can identify with that one in 2020, can't we? The idea of standing around, having a chat with friends, not feeling the need to rush to the next food queue or whatever. Now, notice what I'm doing here. Although this is a propaganda poster, which I've, I've chosen to take and, and adopt bits from that later 1940s period in Germany, I'm not actually choosing to focus in on the propaganda aspect of the poster at the moment. I've gone into the two pictures and looking at what it suggests about the society it is designed for. Um, and that word suggests is utterly crucial. And this is something that I certainly find um, even often older students, but certainly younger students need, is that tentative language making very explicit. Um, and the, the idea that a historian always finds a source useful for something, a source establishes evidence, but, but always with a purpose. So what is it establishing evidence for? Um, with our example there, it was suggesting evidence for society in Western Germany in the later 1940s. And this idea that we always need to be very precise when we're using language. So we need to be precise in not muddling up sources and evidence. They're not the same thing. A source is something for a historian that we can use as evidence to say something about the past. And we might be able to use it with great confidence. We might be quite certain about certain things. But very often, we're relatively uncertain. Um, we might be using the word possible. We might be going as far as the word probable. We might be only suggesting. We may be um, fairly confident. But our use as teachers and modelling of that language when we're using source material in class is incredibly important. That, that precision, let's not make claims for sources as evidence that we cannot substantiate. So far, we've only looked at two pictures from one part of Europe in the 1940s. So all we can do is suggest. But by using those two pictures, Students uh, put ourselves in the position of imagining we've got 13, 14 year olds who've got no idea about Europe in the 1940s. They've already um, got some thoughts and ideas about this period. Where I would take this now, this introduction of a, of a task, and I'll show you how this fits into the activity builder later, but I want to focus on the actual um, extract first. Um, the, the, Propaganda poster, by the way, is in one of the source collections on um, Historiana, and this uh, memory is in the Changing um, Europe unit as well, in the life stories. I've taken an extract. So let me read this extract for you, and I would do this for a class. I would actually read it to them. The memory is of um, from a woman called Marie Berenger, and I do apologise for my appalling French accent. She was 15 years old in 1945, and she lived in Toulon in the south of France. So we've moved country. We're now in the southern part of France. We were in Western Germany. Marie's mother owned the local butcher's shop. 
And here is a memory of Marais. At the time of the liberation, 1944, fields were completely destroyed and the food market was completely disturbed. The shop could only be opened twice a week because of the lack of meat. During this period, Marai's mother was still working at the tabac shop and it gave her the opportunity to exchange some cigarettes for food on the black market. Rationing continued after the war until 1949, but the French economy began to recover very slowly. The provisional government immediately began to organise the return of normal life, including school for children. For a long time, children at school asked each other for news of friends. They asked if they were still alive, if they had died, and how. Mirai describes it as an unusual form of back to normal. She remembers the surprise of finding a friend and saying, oh, you are alive. Now, there are quite a lot of terms in there which students wouldn't necessarily understand straight away. The concept of provisional government will be strange to them. Most students, younger students, won't necessarily know what a black market is. But as you read it, that's, that's okay. They can still get some idea of the first, um, the, the, of some first impressions from this. And my first question to them would be, taking what you can from that, and we're going to keep working with it for a few minutes, children. How does the memory then support the evidence you extracted from the election poster? Where can you see connections between what you could see in the two pictures in the election poster and the experience that Marai remembers? Any thoughts into the, into the chat? Any thoughts about where we've got some similarities between this extract of the memory and the pictures where we've got agreement. Any thoughts as you look at it? Mm, the sense of disturbed and the sense of lack of food in the early period, absolutely. And by 1949, Anything coming through? Yeah, this, the poster suggests uh, an advance of normality, doesn't it? And so does the memory. So we can start to draw students' attention to the fact that we've got some, from these two pieces of source material, we've got some similarities coming out. My second question to them would be, how does the memory then develop further your knowledge of what it was like to live in Europe? So what extra are we learning here? What additional information are we gathering? And I may have to explain to them, of course, about the black market, but I can do that. And you're brilliant students, absolutely. And these are the sorts of things they come up with, that food was still short, that's been, um, brought into focus here hasn't it that, that school was going back to normal but that people hadn't been in school and were going back um and that that sense of loss that hung over people it is extraordinary isn't it the idea that children were asking whether people were still alive or not and yeah you're bringing in very advanced student they're bringing in knowledge about the, the marshall plan fantastic okay so notice what we're doing here is helping students to build up a sense of the period. We're not actually yet focusing on any specific events or specific people, but just getting a sense of the period by introducing different sorts of sources. And as Stephen just put in the chat there, students will come out with this idea that, oh gosh, this is a time of change in Europe. This is a time of movement. It's a movement time, a transition time. And we're at the same time using the sources um, as evidence and showing them that one type of source, uh, an image, a picture, can be corroborated, can be um, connected with, the similarities can be drawn out with another type of source, uh, a memory. And we're also showing them how um, the use of more than one source often creates more knowledge 
So we can be very explicit with students about what's happening here. We're creating more knowledge among ourselves as a class by using more than one source. And of course, we could go on and on in a class and take about, you know, not actually that long, perhaps half an hour, 20 minutes, but adding in perhaps maps and photographs, government advice leaflets to continue to build a student's sense of period to a point where we feel that they've got enough of a sense of what Europe was like in the late 1940s, that when we start to study the events and people, they will feel more of a connection. They will be able to, they will be more interested. They will be able to make more sense of the whole thing. But we'll pause there um, because time is against us and I want to move on to different examples. But that was my first opening was the idea of, of using sources for, for sense of, of period. And this sort of activity could um, be used, created for online use by students in their own time. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, this is all very nice, but I just don't have time to do this sort of thing in my classes. Um, Using the e-activity builder, you could get students to prepare this before they actually arrive in class. So um, here's an example of putting that uh, propaganda poster in here. And what I've done is screenshot of this again to stop us uh, leaping around. Um, but um, that same activity is demoed here on these two slides. So as a teacher, um, notice I have prepared an example annotation. Um, people waiting for something to travel for work, for food, um, Europe in the later 1940s. And then um, the instruction on the next slide would say, now read the memory on the right hand side. And underneath the uh, picture here is the, is the Marais memory that I just read to you. And you ask them to do exactly what I've just done with you, but actually to, to uh, put the annotations on the activity builder. So that's exactly the same as we have just done um, using the analyzing and using the comparing tools. Um, and of course, you've, you've seen in detail how to, to operate those in the introduction. Um, but it shows you that you could set up an activity so that it could be done by students in their, in their own time. And then you wouldn't necessarily need to go through all their work. Um, if you're thinking of heavens, what about workload? Um, because actually with some questioning in the first five minutes of the lesson, you'll quickly get a sense as to who's, uh, who's done the work and who hasn't. Okay, but moving on. We can use sources then as evidence to engage students, to hook them into the learning like this and to develop a sense of period at the start of a topic. But now let's turn to sets of sources. Um, sets of sources we can use as evidence to establish more precise knowledge. Um, and by giving students different sets of sources, we can um, establish evidence for life in Europe in the later 1940s. This is where I really wish we were all together in a room. Um, you would be around small tables and I would be giving you um, sets of sources so that you could talk about this in small groups. Um, but here we are on Zoom, which has advantages, but has disadvantages too. Uh, and we know this season will pass. We will at some time in the future again be in front of our classes and working in the way that we like to work. So what I'm going to have to do is uh, show you this on screens and, and then we'll have some chance to talk about it. But let me just explain what you're going to see. So I'm going to show you some sets of types of sources. That's important to develop knowledge. The different types of sources develop different types of knowledge. And the two questions I want us to, to bear in mind are what can we infer that's a great word. It's one that I also always make my kids use um, in classrooms because infer means what can you work out looking at the detail of the source and bringing in what you already know. It's a great word to infer, to look at the source, to think what can you see and how can you connect it to what you already know. So what can you infer from these sources that you're about to see about life in Europe immediately after World War II ended? And second question, 
what questions about the later 1940s in Europe the sources raise for you. So those are the two things I want you to think about. I'm about to show you four sets of sources. I'm rather restricted by space, so I would normally give a set of about 10 sources per table, per group. I've put six on the slide, and I've been a bit naughty because of copyright, um, and I don't mind what you do in your own classrooms, but because of copyright, you will notice on my maps picture that in fact two of them are not original sources from the time, the uh, bottom right world map and the bottom left map of Europe. Forgive me for that, but uh, copyright was against me. Um, but briefly have a look at the maps first, a selection of, as I say, up to 10 maps. You're a group of students who uh, don't have any great knowledge of this period. So what do you think students, not you as teachers, but what do you think students would be able to infer from looking at the maps? What sort of things do you think they would infer from looking at maps like this? About Europe in the, in the immediate post-war period. Yeah, different borders from now. Yeah. Division, good. It's come straight out, doesn't it, from the maps. The maps are better than a thousand words for divided. Divided worlds, divided countries, new countries, brilliant. Like it, potential conflict, yeah, places where there could be um, arguments going forward. And as we know, there were. Anything else? Mm, yeah, movement of people. Things being forced on people. Yes, that lack of self-determination. Isn't it interesting as well, the world map, the amount of the world that was still under the control of different people. And of course, the bomb damage maps as well start to bring in the issues of, of destruction and what needed repair. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if I change the type of source from maps to photos, photos of places. Again, I would use about 10 with students, but here I've just put six on the slide, so they're not far too small. Photographs from different parts of Europe. And again, what sort of knowledge would students be able to glean from these? Yeah, the destruction is incredible, isn't it? And the idea of a refugee camp in, in Denmark. Yeah. And the, the work that's going on, isn't it? That, that clearing away the rubble mm, in the military. Yeah, absolutely. The borders, they're checking up on you. They also said, look at that bridge. My goodness. <laughs> Crossing that Rhine Bridge must have been quite something, wouldn't it, a military truck, wasn't it? Exactly that. And what was needed in this continent? And then another group of sources, but this time focused on people, photographs of people. Now, I hesitate with some groups of students to use the top source in the middle, somebody in very great distress or possibly even dead. And that's also quite, you have to be very sensitive. Um, with that. But um, obviously knowing my audience this evening, I've left that one in. But again, what do you think students would see and add to their knowledge from this particular selection of photographs? What are we seeing here? Mm, that's great, isn't it? The hope and the hopelessness. It's Begs the question, is it different in different places, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the washing everyday life, <laughs> that's no, I mean, uh, you're probably aware the winter of 1947 was, I believe, pretty much everywhere in the continent, the coldest in the century. And it's like, oh my goodness, really? Right now? Yeah, 
the need for freedom and the fact that the war was still going on in places which of course um people who live in um area around greece will be aware of and probably in popular knowledge but people may not be aware of in popular knowledge if they've been brought up on the other side of the continent okay and the final group objects and again we could draw out from students what more they are learning. So from these different um, pictures, objects, maps, we're communicating an awful lot. They're finding out, they're discovering a lot about Europe in the later 1940s. At the same time, if you make it explicit for them, they will realize that they're getting different types of knowledge from different collections of sources. So maps offer a different type of knowledge from photographs. There may be overlap, but you can get into interesting discussions about the, the different types of knowledge with students and make that very explicit to them. And there we're getting into the nature of evidence that you can establish from sources. And in class, I would use about five different sets of 10 sources and then share in class discussion, both the substantive knowledge they're gaining. So what are we learning about Europe in the later 1940s? But then also the knowledge about how to use sources as evidence that they're gaining in order to answer a historical question. Um, and hopefully they will see that the range of sources really um, adds something. But at the same time, um, they will hopefully uh, have more questions than answers, which is great because by that point, hopefully they're really interested and intrigued and they want to know more about certain things. And instead of you starting and, you know, fascinating as we all are as history teachers, sometimes students turn off when we talk at them it's unbelievable isn't it but they do um, but actually because they have really engaged with the source material hopefully they're burning with questions that you can then help them to find some answers to and their, their curiosity is aroused okay so there's an example of how with sets of sources i would um use um uh, sources as evidence quite explicitly and at the end I'll show you how I've incorporated those into the e-activity builder but I just want to pause for a moment um, and suggest the use of a, a metaphor as as possibly quite useful um, this is something that I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I learned quite late on while teaching um, which and, and I certainly didn't have clear when I was a young teacher, but I was very muddled myself about sources and evidence. And I was also muddled about history and the past. And increasingly, I began to realize that I needed to be much clearer that sources are not the past. They're fragments remaining to us from the past. And that the past isn't a fixed place. If only we could get back to it, we could somehow know it. No, we're left with this, these fragmentary remains. And I once heard a, an academic from a university, a historian, talk about this metaphor. And I found it very helpful, so I wanted to share it with you. I can't claim to be original in any way, but to share the metaphor with you. So the metaphor she used um, was that the source is a window onto the past. And if you think of us on the left, as we are in the present, stood inside that room that you could see in the picture on the left. And we're looking outside to the past. We can't see all of outside, can we? We can only see part of outside from inside the present. We can only see part of the past from the present. And we could choose to focus in very firmly on the other window we can see, or choose to focus in on the tree. Somebody else might notice the wall that they can see, but we would all, if we looked through that window, we would all notice different things because we're all built slightly differently and we observe differently. 
And she talked about um, the idea of a skylight window. So to give the example of the um, object, one of the objects that was on the other slide, this um, um, instruction from um, a government in the late 1940s, a government instruction, a government produced poster essentially, don't photograph in military zones, um, would be an example of a, a skylight window because the view to the outside is, is upwards, the, the top of society. Whereas the family photograph around a war grave may be giving us a window that's much more straight out on the ground floor. And I found she was talking to students, some teachers doing this, and, and we all sort of got quite excited about the metaphor. So I wanted to, to, to share it with you in case you find it useful as well because she went on to talk about how sometimes the source is quite opaque or damaged. So like a damaged window or one of those um, windows that's got glass in, like in your bathroom, so that you um, can't see straight through it or painted glass. But if your source, like your window, is a bit opaque or a bit damaged, then you're definitely going to get different interpretations about what it might tell us about the past. And that, she found and she recommended to us and we found it, it was the case that students could really get a handle on this metaphor they found it quite helpful so that they started to avoid these um oversimplifications of thinking that a particular source would tell them a truth about about the past and, and that was it it was a job they got into this idea of this idea of fragments and, and, the, and different views and different perspectives on the past because I think we need to make very, very, very clear to students. And I think one of the things I did wrong with my work with sources in class for a lot of years was to forget to make it um, connected to the job of doing history. I think it's partly because sometimes history teachers can get very excited about old documents and things and, and, and just get a bit nerdy, a bit excited about uh, old things. But I kept forgetting to um, make it clear to students that historians put together their interpretations about the past using source material as evidence. That is, they take the fragments that remain from the past and they consider them in the light of what they know and what is known and they apply their own ideas about what it is to be human and about the world. And from that, they construct their opinions about the past. And that's what we call history. And I found it's been really helpful with even quite young students to be that explicit. Now, it's complex. It's not something they necessarily catch on straight away. But if you over time drop that sort of talk into your teacher talk in class as you're teaching topics over time in various lessons, if you're quite careful with how you use the language, then students get really used to um, thinking like this. And so here's an example I might use with students. Um, the picture on the left is the cover of the book. I've taken a very short extract from a, a very long book, a superb book, but a, a long book, with very small print. Tony Judd was a, a British historian who died a few years ago. Um, and he published a book which was quite influential um, in certain circles at the time. Um, and it has many opinions in it, but I've chosen the bit here, um, where Tony Judd talks about the European project. And my question to students, and this is probably, you know, some somewhat older students, probably about 15, 16, 17, rather than 12, 13 year olds with this case, but my question to students would be, having worked with some sources about the later 1940s, I'd be saying to students, okay, what source material did this historian use? as evidence to construct his interpretation. Let's have a little look at what he says. But the possibility that things might take a different turn indeed, the likelihood that they would take a different turn had seemed very real in 1945. It was to head off a return of the old demons, unemployment, fascism, German militarism, war, revolution, that Western Europe took the new path with which we are now familiar post-national, welfare state, cooperative, Pacific Europe was not born of the optimistic, ambitious, forward-looking project imagined in fond retrospect of the days 
neuro idealists. It was the insecure child of anxiety, shadowed by history. Its leaders implemented social reforms and built new institutions as a prophylactic to keep the past at bay. So what Tony Judd's saying there, and I mean he's he's actually talking in a chapter about Western Europe, as you can as you as you will know as teachers, but he's he's saying that in his opinion, his interpretation is that the reason that the post-war settlement in Europe was created was because leaders were terrified that there was going to be a return to all the problems of the first half of the 20th century. Now, I wouldn't ask most students whether they agreed with that or not, because most students wouldn't have enough knowledge, to be frank, to make much headway with that. They might have once they've done a lot of study of history. But actually, potentially a more interesting question as you're starting to work with interpretations is, OK, what source material was Tony Judd drawing upon? So I would suggests to you this idea that you can find extracts of, of books, you can find extracts of, of speeches made, you can find extracts of documentaries, but sometimes pause and say to students, okay, so what source material is Tony Judd really focusing on here? What's he chosen to prioritise as evidence to put this interpretation together? And again, very explicitly make it clear to students that sources are used as evidence. So having established the connection between sources as fragments of the past and the interpretations that historians construct, let's make it very explicit to them that ideas are constructed. But then sometimes I also want to disrupt their thinking. So, a really well chosen source or collection of sources can disrupt the popular view. So here's an example of using a source in a way that challenges thinking. Here, and we'll look at it in just a moment, I'm going to show as an example that challenges Judd's view, but it might be that you know of something that is in the popular mind of your students, you know your own students, and you know what popular history from perhaps their families or their communities is in their heads. And you deliberately choose a source that challenges. A classic one that we would use at the moment in the UK is to talk about um, trench warfare in World War I, um, because a lot of students arrive with some idea about Britain in World War I and the Western Front in Belgium and France in 1914. And then we would tell them the truth as a fact that the first shot fired by the British Army was actually fired in West Africa. And you can see them go, oh, um, and actually bring in that source material. But let's have a look at the example here. Um, this is an extract from the political report made by the Congress of Europe that met in The Hague in 1948. And Stephen may remember the time when Inica, some of you will know Inica, arrived in the Eurocleo office with the full document of this Congress. And uh, I still got copies of it that she photographed. And uh, here's a little bit from it. So from the political report, 1948, uh, the Congress of Europe was a, a big meeting of all sorts of worthy people um, from across the continent thinking about the future of Europe. Spiritual values. Whether in the economic or the political field, the aim is not merely to build defensive combination against bankruptcy or totalitarianism. An association resting solely on such negative foundations would possess no guiding principle nor power of endurance. The forces which alone can provide a solid and lasting basis for unity are moral and spiritual. Our common belief in the dignity of man, our common heritage of civilization, our common pride in the contribution which Europe has made in the past to the progress of humanity and our sense of continuing mission in the future. There is the inspiration that brings us and will hold us together. Now, some of that language from 1948 sits very uncomfortably, uh, far too much mention of men and no acknowledgement of the way that Europeans have been exploiting their empires for hundreds of years and 1948 was still exploiting people. So the tone of it may jars to, to, with us. But nevertheless, it's an interesting document. And my question for students would be, how does this text suggest that there was more reasons for setting up the European project than Judd 
has chosen to focus upon. So Judd chose to say it was about essentially negative reasons that Europe um, the European project was created for fear of the past. But this source actually challenges Judd's interpretation. And you can show, show students that. Um, that uh, this fragment of the past is actually suggesting there was some, some positive and hopeful views about, um, about going forward. So this is a a butter screenshot of the original, I'm afraid. But I would always, when I was in class with students, always try, if you can, to show them the real thing as well. Something gets lost when we use sources in class, if we just type them out. So I would show them, and, and I'm sorry, I can't wave the report at you as I would like to. I, I can only show it on the screen. But I would probably print off the copies of this and I would show them part of the original because seeing the original, we learn more. Hey, they were printing in two languages. They were using two official languages at the Congress in 1948. And you wouldn't get that if you just had a typed out um, version that was typed out by the teacher. So I would just uh, make it clear as well to students, the excitement of sources, where it physically comes from. A colleague of mine uses a brilliant example when he does a workshop, which is of um, some material that was decoded in World War II. And he shows students because they can even see how thin the paper was. They can see by how it was typed on an old typewriter um, and corrections were made. Um, and they can see the language it was typed in. They can see from the photographs, unfortunately, they can't hand the originals, but they can see from the photographs that it's one document among many. And all of that helps students to understand the fragment of the past better. Archaeologists are brilliant at this. Archaeologists are brilliant at putting things in context. And I think always try to give some context to the source, source material you're using. Think of it as a physical object in some way. OK, let's move on because time is home is against us. I think we always need to make sure that we help students to know how to deconstruct sources. And this is where layers of inference diagrams can be very, very, very helpful. Um, here's an example of a layer of inference diagram. And imagine that in a class, this would be printed out on an A4 or an A3 sheet, perhaps for one student or one student between two. And again, I'll show you in the e-activity builder how I've incorporated it in um, as, we, as we finish. The layers of inference diagrams are very helpful for helping even high attaining students um, not to forget steps that are involved in looking at source material. So let's return to our political poster first, and this time um, let's actually use it as a political poster. You could introduce this at the start of, say, learning about Western Germany, 1945 to 49. And you could start by saying, OK, what can you actually see? Not what you can work out from your knowledge or because you're smart, but what can you actually see? Don't forget to look carefully. And students write in what I've made the yellow box here, what they can actually see. And only after they've spent some time thinking what they can actually see, do you then let them move to the next layer, the blue layer in this case. What can you infer? What can you work out? from what you can see, connecting it to things that you know. And the way I would use the inference diagram this way is that I would only do those first two layers at first. And then I might go away and teach the topic. And then I would bring back the diagram, having taught the topic and say, okay, now connect what you've learned to this poster, contextualize it, put it in context. And again, it makes very, very explicit to students the importance of having and deploying contextual knowledge. Very, very useful if you've got to do revision for exams for this, um, not least at the beginning of a revision period, because if they haven't done the work and they can't do it, it really shows up to them that they've got to go away and learn some stuff, otherwise they're gonna come back, which uh, can be quite helpful with some students. Here's another example, slightly different. You can put different things in the layers. 
This one still breaks down though the thinking to stages. So the first box this time is what can you see? Who can you see? Where does it seem to be? When might it be? Why might it have been taken? So again, it's about getting ideas going. And then, and obviously you wouldn't show them the blue box straight away. I've put this on the screen for ease. Um, you then tell them it's Welsh women working in a newly reopened factory in the later 1940s. And then get them to reflect on how that changes their first ideas. And then what questions do you have? What do you need to know in order to understand this picture better? So perhaps as a way of introducing a topic and building curiosity. And again, very easily transferable to the e-activity builder and I'll, I'll show you how I've, I've done that. But I would use the analyzing and sorting tools and, and building up the layers page by page for this. And remember, we're always asking questions. So um, let's ask some questions here. What can we learn about displaced people from images from the time? So there's always a purpose to having sources in the class. We're always asking a question. That's what a historian would do. Maybe I would build it up, ask a question. What can we learn about displaced people from the images that survive? And I would be asking them that question, getting them to look carefully and tell me what they can learn. And then I might, and again, I've got to put this on layer, but I might add to artifacts, add to objects that survive, in this case, um, ID, ID cards. And then I might add some contextual knowledge for them. And build up the layers page by page. Obviously, I wouldn't put them all on one screen for students. But this idea of releasing, what can we learn from photographs? Then what can we learn from the ID cards? And then how does some contextual knowledge help you to understand them even more? And I won't go through those in depth now, but you can have a look um, at those at your, your leisure later. But another good question that you then may be able to ask students, which gives a slightly different focus to using the sources as evidence, is why is it so hard to generalize about the refugee experience? Okay, let's make a long required to return to our e-activity builder. Um, here's an example of uh, the teacher view of uh, using the discovery tool, um, which you can use to create to make links. Um, so what I've got here is a part done example of the, the teacher version. Um, and this would be making links between those source, sources about refugees and the uh, knowledge about refugees. This is uh, what the student would see at the start of the activity. So uh, you'd be giving them potentially uh, two images in the middle, German prisons of war as one set of displaced people and German East Prussian refugees and then they would discover from there different things about them. And then after having discovered um, using the tool they could be ready for class discussion or they could write some sort of response for you about the refugee experience. Okay so if you want to take this further before I leap into the activity, if you want to take this further, if you want to, um, the uh, various sources that I've used today are all on Historiana in the source collection post-war Europe and in the unit changing Europe post-war. And if you want to get further into some of what I've been talking about today about using sources as evidence for historical inquiry in the classroom, and indeed beyond for, for citizenship education, for enabling students to um, get better at spotting things like fake news, um, then I would recommend the work that's been going on at Stanford University with Professor Sam um, Weinberg. And um, just for your um, help, uh, I've put the Historiana e-learning tools link there as, as well. I thought it was useful to have one slide with it all together. But I wanted to spend the last part of our um, time together um, with the e-activity builder again to return to what, what I hope is going to be uh, um, quite
quite a fun and interesting journey for people. We're enjoying um, the way that this is developing and exploring, and uh, hopefully you'll have lots of great ideas about how you can use it with students. So the um, again for your um, ease, I've linked through the uh, video the introduction that Lorraine did. Um, but uh, what I've also done here, and hopefully I click on the link. If not, I've opened it underneath. Is I have um, I'll just walk you through how I have set this activity up. Um, I'm just going to show you where it is on the screen. Forgive me while my screen sort of warms up. If not, I will leap back to the other one. So you will find the work that I just talked about developed as an e-activity if you go into Historiana Teaching and Learning. And then if you scroll down that page, I've just done it already. Um, right at the bottom at the moment, you will come to, oh, it's taken it back to the top for me while we've been talking. Okay, I'll scroll right down. Sorry, it's slightly irritating when people scroll on screen. I was trying to avoid that. But right at the bottom, you will see um, this uh, little uh, friend here. How does a historian use sources as evidence? So this is a pupil version of what we've just gone through. And then when you click on it, when you click on the um, pen, then you get to this. Now I have put it hopefully into student view and I'll just walk you through so you can see um, a bit of it. So first of all, what I will learn in this activity. I've actually chosen in my version here to actually do some reading for them. I've deliberately set it up. I'm, I'm not trying to use every single tool here. I've actually, because it's work with sources, I've used the um, analyzing tool quite a lot as you will see. So first of all, some things about what historians what do historians not do or think? I'm not going to give you time to read that because it's pretty much what I've just talked about today. And then takes them through what a source is and how a source historian uses a source. And then at this point, I chose to put in the metaphor that I talked to you about. You can see they get instructions first. And then when they close the instructions, they can then um, look at the actual slide. Um, and then some uh, more for them to read. But this time then moving on to um, looking at the political poster. So um, there's some instructions again for them and uh, close the instructions and they can get on with the task. And then you'll notice that this is the instructions for what we went through before with the memory from Mirai, but this time turned into a student friendly version. And then I talked about building more knowledge and brought in what we looked at already to do with maps and analyzing photographs, these things that you saw earlier and more photographs that you saw earlier, the same questions as I asked you and objects. And then I've asked them to think and to reflect about what different types of sources reveal about different knowledge. And then there is the example from Tony Judd put into the um, activity for students with thinking and the interrupting source. And they've got to think how that challenges Judd's interpretation. And then what I have done here is put in the, uh, I've created different, slightly different discovery here actually. Um, but I've, I've introduced the idea that historians rarely start their research by working with sources. Actually, first they tend to read a lot about what has already been written. And that means that when they work with sources, they're already connecting them to their knowledge. And so what I've done is create this discovery task so that the students get a chance to experience that idea of creating and connecting um, sources um, to knowledge. And then, um, it, the idea is that it's a short introduction to some of the ways, um, I do apologise there, there's an S missing off that short introduction, I need to improve, I need to change that Lorraine, some of the ways that historians use sources as evidence, um, and just for them to write themselves some notes here about what you want to remember for next time you use sources in your study of the past. So it's meant to be a student self-guided, um, not everything there is to know about using sources as evidence as a historian, but uh, hopefully introducing them to some ideas about uh, using sources as a historian. Okay, so at that point, um, I'm going to, to 
stop talking um, and thank Lorraine hugely for for having my back in terms of the uh, putting the links in the chat box for you so you can take and save those much more easily and open the floor for any questions any observations any thoughts any great ideas anything you want I shall stop sharing screen and then it's uh, easier to uh, for people to see each other which is nicer stunned everybody into uh, into silence it's also quite late <laughs> so uh, that's absolutely fine as well if you just wants to say oh mm, actually i'd like to go away and just think about things thank you very much and have some tea Thank you. That's really that's really kind. I uh, hope it's I hope it's helpful. Oral history. That's an interesting one. Yes, um, and another type of source. And I think what's really exciting about history and history teaching at the moment is the wider range of sources that we're starting to use in the classroom. That's been particularly driven by some of the young academic historians who. Uh, for example, I, I attended a webinar last week by um, a historian called Dr. Toby Green, who is working on the history of West Africa. And when you study African history as opposed to European history, um, you don't get very far if you just rely on written sources because either they have not survived or you are very much using the sources of, of Europeans about Africa. Um, but in fact, with lots of, he was fascinating because with lots of knowledge, um, he really was showing us how looking at some of the fragmentary maps that survive, um, using some of the um, information about using gold objects, he then had us absolutely enthralled because he was talking about where the gold had come from and what that implied for methods of exchange and uh, what that meant for credit systems and how much less gold there was in certain periods than others. I think we can use all these sources as evidence. I think it's a tremendous challenge for us as history teachers to get our own knowledge up to date. And so I'm, I'm relieved that um, uh, historians are helping us out here and some, some fantastic new work, which is no longer locked away in libraries and expensive monographs. It's actually books that you can pick up um, in bookshops, you know, history for not too much money, you know, popular books as opposed to, and, and we can learn this stuff as history teachers and then bring it into the classrooms. Um, but I think you can use oral history, you can use any source material in class. It's about, yeah, having the confidence to do it yourself, but great work coming out of academic historians that will help us and, and let's all stick together and, and keep sharing the information in, in sessions like this because um, so I'm certainly learning a lot from attending you know, webinars and material with other teachers myself about how they've learned stuff. Um, good, I'm glad you found it found it useful and uh, you know, it'd be, be great to, um, oh, it's lovely to see familiar faces and many, many unfamiliar faces and very, very much hope that before too long we can start doing these things back in rooms together and then have a really good chat because what will be really good now would be to head off to the cafe for a coffee or to head off to the bar with a beer and continue to talk about sources and what would work with particular students in particular places. Um, big thumbs up from Brianna, who I really miss. <laughs> she, she knows we've got some good bars in York and I know there's some great bars in Sarajevo as well. <laughs> so um, there's um, another question in the chat from Georgia who says, uh, are there rights to be considered? Do you mean rights as in um, copyright issues or, sorry, is that what you meant, Georgia, in terms of rights? Hi, um, it's about oral history. I, I asked it uh, uh, concerning oral history. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there can be. And I mean, certainly there are if you're going to publish things on the web in the same way as, you know, issues with with um, sort of people as well as copyright people's personal personal memories i have found and i've used a lot of oral history in classrooms over the years that in a school classroom people are terribly generous and, and will very happily 
share. Um, what I have sometimes done is change a name if I felt that there may be a, a, an issue of somebody being recognisable um, or anonymise things. But but I've never had a problem with with that. Is, does that answer your question, Georgia? Is that what you meant? Yeah, and I think. I think very often people are incredibly willing for things to be used with children in if it was private classrooms, if you know what I mean, i.e. where it's contained within the teacher in the classroom. It's obviously very different if it's going up on the line or for, up online, which is why I was a little bit limited with some source use this afternoon. But um, but um, change your name if you're in any doubt that somebody might be recognisable or oversensitive. Um, I think also Stephen had a question. Yeah, Stephen, I had a question. I missed you. <laughs> Thanks, Alan, for, for, for sharing the, uh, all these different ways in which you can use uh, sources as evidence. Well, one of the things that I liked most was when you made a connection between, for example, the sources and historical, uh, like um, a historian's interpretation or like a memory and how do these sources, what does it tell you? So how, how do you go about making these connections? Because it's a bit... I guess there is a certain amount of serendipity chance that you find that. Um, but is there also a method to it that you, for example, would start with historical interpretation and then know what to look for? Uh, do you understand what I mean? I think I do. Let, well, let me try and you can tell me if I've got it wrong. I would say that um, you set me quite a challenge with Europe in the 1940s. It's much easier if you want to do something like that with younger students to go earlier like the Middle Ages or even earlier to the ancient world, to a period where we know that the sources that we have are very fragmentary. So for example, um, you can fit all onto one sheet of A4 or A3, pretty much what exists about the Emperor Nero at, at certain times. And then you could actually put in the center a piece of writing about the Emperor Nero and, and, and even sort of 12 year olds can almost draw lines and show exactly what the historian has drawn from in the surviving written evidence about the Emperor Nero. And um, obviously that gets much harder when you're sort of in the 1940s and there's so much stuff that survives. Um, so I have to say, I haven't yet cracked how to do it in a more modern period with really young students. Um, but I think it, but I think they can get the idea of it in the in the early periods, pardon me, or anywhere where we've got very fragmentary remains of the past um but i would love it if somebody could crack it for the more modern period because i think we, we we should be able to or maybe it's something that we should perhaps build up is a bank of resources where we say well we've got these sort of fairly you know well-known popular historians of the period let's let's actually crowdsource um some some activities where we can we can make it explicit but i think above all it's the making explicit the fact that there is this connection you know that historians don't just make things up they actually rely on source material as evidence so um you're not seeking to to necessarily show all the evidence they use you're just getting the point across that they do do that does that um, answer your question and perhaps the, then another question if you find for example well a historian's in interpretation and you you can somehow select the source that goes against that. Um, there's now a lot of distrust of authorities with fake mm -hmm. news, etc. And, and to a certain extent, we present historians as experts and like reliable. So how do you strike the balance? Because if you sort of say, well, one source that contradicts a historian is probably, it casts a spell of doubt, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sort of debunk the whole interpretation. Um, so... <laughs> How do you go I about think, that? I think because I I would I've moved away from um, perhaps what I did do in the past, which was to, which was I've moved much more to the to, to the idea of emphasising that historians' views are constructed, and that when people complain, say from the right, oh you're revising history, it's like yes, of course I am. That's what a historian does. So an academic historian spends their whole life reflecting and revising and rethinking and reviewing the past. That is what history is. But I've spent much more time emphasising, yes, but they don't just do that because they felt like it while eating their cereal in the morning or because they just grabbed something off Twitter. They actually, uh, so that's why I'm doing a lot of emphasising the process, that they do a lot of reading and understanding and thinking about what is already known. And then they do follow certain disciplinary processes in relation to evidence. And the crucial thing is that every opinion doesn't go. Every opinion isn't valid. It's, is your 
opinion based on verifiable evidence. So can it essentially be challenged with, with evidence? And if it can be, if it's based on evidence and it can be challenged using evidence, then it's a valid opinion. D does that make sense? I've spent more time yeah, I, I, looking I, I at new so. Also, if you make it a bit more constructive, it's not like black and white. It's just we get yeah. a fuller picture of the past. So how could you rewrite this history so that it sort of um, aligns with the new evidence that's now available? Yeah. And, and sometimes, I mean, it's interesting because sometimes, of course, new evidence does come up to become available. I mean, such as, uh, I mean, classically, when historians wandered into briefly the archives in Moscow after the after the um, end of the Cold War. But actually, sometimes as well, historians review the same evidence and come to different perspectives. And, and that's an interesting one for students and quite hard to explain to students. But but I think we do have to be very upfront about it. But yes, two human beings asking it's about the questions we ask of the past and it's about the methods that we use to analyze source material as evidence that produce different answers and as long as our questions are, are, are valid ones and our methods of analysis and using of sources are valid then our opinion is valid and should be respected doesn't mean it's 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 the last word on something but if you haven't gone through that process then you know you're just a you know, you're doing something else, you're not doing history. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Bayana, you uh you wanted to say something and I'm aware also people have to go. So please please go if you need to go as well. We're well into stoppage time, but it's lovely to chat. <laughs> uh thank you, Helen, for the, the great presentation. I enjoyed every moment really. What I wanted to comment upon is the following. Uh you you had some uh, uh book actually somewhere about mm. the yeah and that really triggers me to think further uh there is so much uh books which are printed every day but what i miss actually i cannot find the the uh, a community that i have faith in that i have trust you know that some piece is good and it's worth to to go through it so uh, maybe, I don't know, is it in Historiana or there were, there have been some talks I remember years ago in Euroclear, okay, let's recommend the books. Let's get to know uh, people actually what is produced, what is worth reading. Because this yeah. summer, actually, I found, um, I think he's a British historian, Max Hastings, and it was translated to Serbian language. And in a way it was one of these, you know, cheap books. Yeah, yeah. And, I yeah. got it in a way like I had already impression yeah. without yeah. readings, but reading it actually what I have found, which is remarkable there, is uh, uh, evidences from different perspectives. Yeah. Letters, because he's a journalist. Yes. And I really found it like, okay, I shouldn't react that way without reading. So maybe uh, we as a community could have some you know, a space somewhere sharing, look, this might be worth reading. Yeah, this is good, this is good. And I think um, we, you, I mean, Briano, it's interesting because one of my jobs over Christmas is gonna to be to read a great new book that's just been published. And Andreas at Euroclear immediately said to me, can you write a review on it? It's like, oh, thanks Andreas. I was gonna just read the book over Christmas. But there are, I mean, on Euroclear, and perhaps Lorraine, you could find it and pop it into the chat. We have got some uh, book reviews online. It, it, would that be useful? To, and do more on reviewing of books okay so we need to we need to crowdsource that one a bit don't we but as you say people that could and it's something that i know teachers over here ask for a lot it's like you know i haven't got time to sort it out for myself give me a book review so i know which ones i want to pick and what i'm getting from it yeah no i think that'd be really useful hey well um stephen's put it up as well so we've got some book reviews up there already um but yeah let's um let's make it a new year's resolution to um to do some more because that would be really useful for everybody, wouldn't it? Um, brilliant. No, I, I definitely agree, Boyana, and it's something that where we should also like pull our our sources. Uh, in um, Yoka, the founder of Eurocleo, so she she started it with this, uh, but now we also gave it like a, a, a one place where you can find all of them um, at Eurocleo. But you can see that recently we. Uh, reviewed like more uh, games, for example, because we had a campaign on the use of games. Uh, but of course, the, the actual books, but uh, we should promote it more. And also, if you have books that you that you can recommend, uh, please share them uh, via European. Okay, 
Shall we bring it to an end then and go and have a rest of the evening? It's only um, uh, 10 to 6 my time, so I'm still going to go and have my dinner, but it's a bit later for some of you, so you're amazing. <laughs> so I'm going to hand back to Lorraine and say a massive thank you for your attention this evening. And please stay safe and well and have a good um, break coming up in whatever way you celebrate it. And I uh, hope to see you properly in person sometime in 2021. Take care. Thanks, Lorraine. Well, just to say thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, I've saw really a lot of messages in the chat, so really happy to hear also your feedback um, that this was helpful and inspiring. Uh, as I said at the beginning, you'll be receiving the recording of uh, this session, as well as all the links that were mentioned, and possibly a small uh, feedback form if you are so kind as to provide us with some feedback. Um, there is another three uh, sessions in this um, series of webinars, so make sure to attend these as well if you're interested. And I think that will be all. So thank you again so much for joining. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions and we'll be in touch with the emails. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. See thank you, soon. Helen, so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>